recipients are panelists. So you've got to um, select all panelists or, or use the arrow beside the word two to select all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your note. We're very delighted and honored today to have two very special guests with us, Dr. Luschim Arvid Charlie and Dr. Nancy Turner. Their presentation will begin after a brief overview of work that uh, the ISCBC has been doing with communities around BC this past year. Questions will be, um, there will be a question period and you can drop a question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, which is different than the chat box, just to take a look. The nice thing about the Q&A box is you can upvote your questions. So if you see your questions already in there, you can click on it, the thumbs up button, and you can bring it to the top of the list. Um, the workshop is being recorded and it will be posted to our website because there's many folks that could not attend today. So then it can be shared with those, those, those people, which is great. Um, one more Zoom note just to... Um, uh, uh, be able to see people better. You can click on the top um, right of your screen. The, the viewing, the, the speaker view, there's a side-by-side -side speaker view. Um, and then you can um, see the speaker as well as the slides. And Fiona, Sue, did you have a note to add? Yes, thank you, Sue. Um, just because this is uh, not a webinar and a workshop, if you do have a question, um, there's no Q&A box. Rather, oh. please put them in a chat and I'll be tracking questions and I'll make sure um, that those that need the questions have the questions. There thank you me. go. Well, thank you for telling me that because I can't see anything on my screen. <laughs> Good tip. So use the chat box, not the Q&A box, which doesn't exist. <laughs> All right. No, they're over at the meeting. Oh, there's somebody yeah. coming in. Wonderful. All right, folks, we're just going to get started. Um, to begin with, we'd love to find out a little bit about you, our attendees. Um, I think somebody's not on mute. Maybe Fiona, you can fix that for us. Um, please type your name and your workplace or your organization or your area of interest and your location into the chat box while we're getting started, just as a bit of a round table. And, um, and don't forget to change the recipient to all panelists and attendees to message everybody. I now am delighted to have JJ Holmes with us here this morning. I'm gonna introduce JJ and he will welcome our wonderful elder Lorna Shooter. JJ is the operations supervisor and the safety officer with the Lower Nickel Indian Band Development Corporation and he's based in Merritt. When it comes to invasive species, JJ fulfills many roles including being one of our board members on the ISCBC. He also does lots of training, coordinating training for employees, and he works with a wide variety of organizations and First Nations community to increase awareness of the impacts of invasive species and noxious weeds. He's had lots of experience in boots on the ground work, and he's really keen to promote stewardship of the land and to try to protect food sources and medicinal plants. Away from stewardship, JJ is also actively involved in the lo local minor hockey league. I will turn it over to you, JJ. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that, Sue. Um, first, I'd just like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Invasive Species Council of BC. Um, we're happy to have um, you all take part or take the time uh, to be with us here today. Um, your input is very valuable, as is your time. Um, we acknowledge and appreciate uh, everyone being here today. Uh, the Invasive Species Council of BC gratefully acknowledges the territories of the Indigenous people of BC, where we live, work, uh, to maintain a healthy ecosystem for all. Um, my name is JJ Holmes. I grew up in Schwachman, which is in the traditional territory of the Silk people. I now live and play in the Nkwakmakchin people uh, traditional territories. I've worked with the ICBC for the past six years as a member. Um, and over the past three years, I've been uh, an active board member with the Invasive Species Council of BC. Um, just one thing to note, uh, Fiona's mentioned it and Sue's mentioned it, but uh, the event is being recorded to share with those folks that could not attend today um, and will be available on the ICBC website. Uh, to begin, we are honored to have Elder Lorna Shooter from the Lorna Nick First Nation join us uh, with a prayer to start the workshop off in a good way. Um, so Lorna, you can take the stage. Good morning. Good morning, participants of the IASC meeting today. 
Uh, my name is Lorna Shooter. I am a member of the Little Watt Nation. I resided in Lower Nicola Indian uh, with the Lower Nicola Indian Band, and I work for the Lower Nicola Indian Band, managing a community garden we call Shaluth Community Garden. Um, I like to uh, say a prayer to our Creator, if you don't mind. Um, Dear Creator, thank you for this beautiful day and for our good health and clear minds. Creator, please bless all the people who are attending this ISC meeting today. Um, Creator, please bless us with a healthy spirit, clear mind, so we can conduct business in a good way. Creator, please bless us all with your love and protection so we can conduct our work in a good way, good and safe manner. Please keep us safe in our travels. Bless all those for participating in all our relations. Amen. Thank you, Lorna. Um, we're grateful to have you here today um, and, and support with us uh, for this initiative today. Um, now I'll turn it back over to Sue to, to review the agenda for the day. Thank you, JJ, and thank you so much, Lorna, for that wonderful way to start our workshop and that wonderful opening. Lovely to have you. Um, for the past six years, we have hosted this workshop at our annual forums, which bring together Indigenous communities and organizations from across BC. We identify needs, challenges, and opportunities around invasive species management. Of course, we would prefer to be together in person today, sharing a meal um, and seeing each other in person, but we're glad to have also this virtual platform to be able to get together this way. I'm just going to continue with my screen sharing. Can folks give me a thumbs up if they can see that okay? Thank you, Lorna. <laughs> All right, JJ gave us our acknowledgement, which was wonderful. And I'll just go through a quick agenda for, for this morning. Thank you to, again to Lorna for the welcome, the wonderful welcome and the opening prayer. Um, I'll do a quick slideshow about the Invasive uh, Indigenous Network and um, ISCBC's work in 2021 and 22. Then we'll introduce our fabulous guest speakers, Dr. Luce Cheem, Arvid Charlie, and Dr. Nancy Turner. At just about 12 o'clock, um, we'll be finishing the formal presentation part of the workshop and we will be going into some breakout rooms for Indigenous guests and for the Indigenous Invasive Species members. And I'll let you know when that's, that happens and then we'll do a closing and we should be finished around 12.30. So you can see our mission here. Um, the council is 16 years old uh, this year and we're the largest nonprofit working with invasive species in Canada. And we do this through a variety of programs including community outreach and education, training, uh, in industry professionals and really lots of key partnerships with organizations, with stewardship groups, uh, with industry, of course, and with all levels of government, including, of course, First Nations. Partnerships are really key to all the work that we do, and we're, we, we are really proud to be able to work with Indigenous communities and partners throughout the province. We host three different networks, of which this one is one of them, the Indigenous Invasive Species Network. And the network has just over 200 members. Um, representing about 90, 92 communities and organizations across the province. And this past year, we were really fortunate to be able to work with 14 nations in a more direct way, even given the challenges of, of uh, the pandemic. One of those nations was uh, Penelicut. Um, on the beautiful Penelicut Island, we were really lucky to get over there and uh, help them with some identification and a field tour. So some of our 2021 and 2022 highlights. Um, as I said, we were able to work directly with five First Nations and we were able to provide um, some training. Um, we actually got into the field with four of the five of them and um, provided planning management support and um, developed um, with them indigenous uh, plant management plans. We're continuing wor to work with nations across Northern BC to support their development of invasive plant management plans including Soto, West Moberly, and Blueberry River. And we're really excited to be working with Leonard Joe, who's collecting Indigenous case studies and video interviews on the impacts of invasive species on traditional practices. 
and these should be ready to share with everyone this spring. We were also delighted to work with the Métis Nation BC and we provided two workshops uh, with their members. We hosted nearly 40 youth at the youth workshop and uh, we did a community workshop for, um, for all the communities across for the province and we had a graphic illustrator capture those discussions. So you can see the graphic here from that um, graphic illustrator in January. Um, really fun to have that, that graphic image We also did uh, a, a three-day training program for the land guardians in partnership with an indigenous ethnobotanist. And we had some great feedback from the organizer. And um, we also this year prioritized indigenous cultural awareness training for all of our uh, council staff, just to support our continuous growth and learning. We worked to develop a range of education resources for communities and for youth. And we have a new Invasive Wise education program. So educators should really check this out on our website. So teachers access free activities, lessons, and supporting resources on our webpage and receive a virtual visit with um, some of our wonderful invasive species educators. Uh, they'll get class kits and they'll also have some support if they want to connect to community to actually do stewardship projects. This was a very sunny day at the Little Chiefs Primary School, as you can see. <laughs> they can hardly look at the camera. So we launched a specialized learning center as well in 2021, and it really grew our ability to connect with nations and communities across BC in, in this virtual way and developed a number of new courses, including an online pesticide applicator certification course, a plant-wise course for gardeners um, and horticulture industry, a uh, course for tour the tourism operators, and observing and reporting invasive species. And we're very excited to announce that we've got two uh, of our very popular print resources, um, Invasive Species That Affect Indigenous Communities, and the Indigenous Community Toolkit are being developed into online courses that will be launched this spring. We're very much looking forward to 2022 and working further with you all. Um, there's my email and, and our website there. Please connect with me um, later on if you have any questions. Thanks for your attention. I'm gonna pass it back over to JJ now to introduce our guest speakers. Awesome, thanks for that, Sue. Um, I'm honored to introduce two of our guest speakers for today's workshop. Uh, the first one, we're gonna start off with Dr. Um, Lushjim Arvid Charlie is a respected elder of the Cowichan tribes, born um, at the Kweichim, one of the villages of the Cowichan nation, a fluent speaker of his traditional language, his knowledge of plants and environments comes from a deep training and experience. Uh, starting in his early childhood years, he's learned his knowledge from his greatest, or from his great grandfather, Loose Jim, uh, whose name he has inherited, his great grandmother and others of their generation who grew up in the last decade of the 19th century. His father was a famous carver and an artist, Simon Charlie. Um, even as a boy, um, Arvid was a hunter, a fisher, contributor to his family's <clears throat> meals and provisions. From the age of 14, he was a canoe puller, and over the years, he skippered many racing canoes. In the 1970s, he started his employment with the Cowichan tribes, working on various land control land and culture related contracts. He's dedicated the last few decades to ensuring the survival of the Heliquimnum language and documenting his traditional knowledge plants environment so that it can continue into the future. Uh, Lustium received an honorary doctor letter of degree at Vancouver Island U University. He is a special and a unique man. Not only does he hold expert exponential knowledge about the plants, language, cultural, and environments of the Kwechim people, but he is kind, generous, and designated teacher and elder. His book, Loose Jim's Plants, undertaken in over two decades of collaboration with Nancy Turner as they reflect on his knowledge and wisdom. Our second speaker, uh, Dr. Nancy Turner. Um, Dr. Nancy Turner is an ethnobotanist and a designated professor professor 
uh, at the School of Environmental Studies at the University of Victoria. She has worked with First Nations elders, cultural specialists in Northwest North America for over 50 years, helping to document, retain, and promote the traditional knowledge plants and environments, including Indigenous foods, materials, and traditional medicines. Her two-volume award-winning book, Ancient Pathways, Ancestral Knowledge, um, integrated her long-term research. She was authored and co-authored 30 other books, including Plants of Haida Gwaii, The Earth's Blanket, Keeping It Living with Doug Duer, uh, Saanich Ethnobotany with Richard Held Heldaba, and Food and Plants of Coastal First Nations, and over 150 book chapters and papers. Uh, her recent edited book, Plants, Peoples, and Places, The Roles of Ethnobotany and Ethnoecology in Indigenous People, Lands Rights in Canada and Beyond in 2020, was awarded the Daniel Austin Book Award by the American Botanical Council. She has received a number of awards <clears throat> in her work, including membership, in Order of British Columbia in 1999 and the Order of Canada in 2009 and many honoring honorary degrees from university. She has also received the Federation of Humanity and Social Science Canada Prize um, for Ancient Pathways and the RSCGs in Ingstern Medal 2002. Thank you again for both of you um, honor us and taking uh, part in sharing your wisdom and knowledge um, in today's presentations. Um, Sue, I'm not sure if we got um, Luce Jim on or not, but um... yeah, I was able to connect with him by phone and um, he's really sensed his regrets. He's having some computer issues. His computer won't even turn on. It's it's completely blank. So I told him to um, get in touch with me and I could walk him through if somehow it, it ends up working. He was blaming his grandkids for having too many video games <laughs> on his computer. <laughs> but uh, so he sends his regrets. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry to relay that message. Good. We probably Thanks, just Stephanie. roll into to Nancy's presentation then. We shall. Thank you, JJ. Okay. Thank you, JJ. And um, I wrote, I've been texting with Liz Chim off to the side here, and he feels so badly that he can't get on and he would really love to be with us. And uh, I told him not to worry, not to, not to fret, but if he does get on, of course, we'll all be just delighted. And meanwhile, I told him I'll do my very best to represent him in the work that we've done together. And uh, I appreciate that very kind um, introduction, JJ. And, uh, and I just want to also raise my hands to Lorna um, Shooter for her wonderful prayer to start us off in a good way. And um, also to acknowledge that I'm here on the territory of the Snunemuch Nation here on uh, Protection Island off Nanaimo. And uh, there are wonderful people here and all over BC, I've had the privilege of working with so many wise, kind, generous knowledge holders and learning about plants. So um, I'm going to uh, do a PowerPoint here. And just, Sue, I just check with you, uh, how long should I speak, do you think? What would be the best time, timing? Nancy, you can talk to us all day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I won't do that. That would not be very kind. But, uh, um, but you, okay, I'll, you, I'll go for 40 minutes. You have 40, 45 minutes, 50 okay. minutes would be fabulous. Okay, that sounds good. And hopefully we'll have time for uh, questions afterwards. I'm just going to share my screen and then do a view slideshow. And I hope you can all see that. Looks great. So, yes, I thought the plants we love was a good way to start because um, the connections that I've made with indigenous uh, knowledge holders all over the province really starts with that connection of plants that we love, the mutual love of plants, I say. And uh, plants can bring us together in, in really amazing ways. 
Uh, so we um, we were asked to, to talk about medicinal plants a little and the cultural values of plants and how indigenous peoples have cared for and looked after and, uh, the land tended, we say, or cultivated the land uh, in a world that is changing. I get the odd sign saying your internet is unstable. So I hope that that is just a temporary thing and that you can still follow me okay. Everything sounds and looks good. Okay, thank you. So again, I raise my hands to the indigenous communities throughout British Columbia um, with respect, gratitude for your care of the lands and waters and all our non-human relatives for countless generations since time immemorial. And thank you so much to Sue and Fiona and JJ and all of the folks there. This is an amazing uh, group that you've brought together and um, I'm really excited to learn more about it in, in your uh, introduction there. And uh, of course, I've put a few names up because I really think that the, the names of the plants are a very important part of the knowledge. And the names um, in different languages show re people's relationships to them. So we have Pomchaltz, Cranberry, uh, Taka, Salal, and Kalk, the wild rose three of my very favorite plants, and I know Liz Jean loves them too. So you've already had an introduction from uh, JJ from Liz Jean, and what an amazing man he is. We, I first met him in the late 1990s and uh, at a workshop, and we went on a, a path together with a group of um, interns from the Cowichan Nation, and I was just amazed at the depth of his knowledge at that time and realized that this, this man held really special knowledge that um, was so important. And we, we became friends and started working together right around that time and over the years uh, done with, with various people, with students and others, um, a whole bunch of interviews. We've gone out in the field, we've gone up Mount Aerosmith, uh, so up into the high country, down to the ocean, and uh, to Mount Prevost, uh, they, which I should give the couch a name for. I'm sorry that I don't know it. But um, Everywhere he took me or places that he has been as a, a young man and even in his childhood and was able to show me things that I never, I never knew about before. For example, at the top of Mount Prevost near Duncan, uh, we have um, the yellow glacier lily. And Lucie wasn't entirely sure of the Cowichan name, but it's called Scamich. In uh in Slatmuch and Twich and Schwatmuchin. And uh some of you from those areas recognize those names perhaps. Um and so it might be Scamich or something related to that, even in Cowton, because it would have been um sorry, if you can hear a dog barking, our little grand granddaughter is just getting home and everybody's excited about that at our house. Um, so this was really exciting for me to see this beautiful patch of yellow glacier lilies that Jim had known about and people eat the roots, the, the bulbs of these plants and they cook them and they dry them and trade them just like the camas and some of the other root vegetables that people that people know and use. So as uh, JJ mentioned, Luschim, when he was a little boy, knew his great grandfather, Luschim. And I was amazed to hear that because his great grandfather was born in 1870. And if we think about the elder Luschim and uh, his grandparents, 
they would have been living in the Cowichan area before the first white people arrived in that, in that area. So there's this amazing link of time depth, depth that Lustim has that very few people can, can really say. Um, just one generation or two removed from the first uh, time that the first Europeans arrived with, with all of our backyard plants. Like <laughs> we bring our, we tend to bring our backyards with us when we travel to places. And this is a problem in terms of invasive species because um, we've brought in broom, we've brought in dandelion, we've brought in all kinds of hawthorn and English ivy and so forth. Um, because they're the, the plants of the English ancestors and we need to feel like we are home when we move places. And this has happened all over the world and created a huge problem of homogenization in the world. Anyways, I'm getting away, uh, away from myself, but uh, I just wanted to mention that. And down in the lower corner of this PowerPoint, you see a fishing lure that was carved by Luzchim's father, Simon Charlie, who is, as, um, as was said, a, a really wonderful and famous artist. And that's from the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. So this is the book that we did together, Luzchim's Plants, um, where we tried to record and document as, as much as possible Luzchim's knowledge about all these different plants, well over a hundred different species and their Cowichan names, uh, Hulkamitnam names and uh, what relationships Luzchim has with them. So for Cowichan tribes, uh, the Cowichan are a Salishan people, uh, Coast Salish, Hulkamitnam speaking. So they're related to the uh, Stolichans and the Musqueam, Tawasan um, uh, of the Fraser lower Fraser area, the Fraser Valley and the Fraser Delta, as well as to the Shishath of Seashelt people, the Squamish people, um, and the Kusanich and uh, Songhees, Lekwungen peoples. So there, there are a lot of relatives. And if you look at their names for plants, you can tell that they, uh, they share a number of, uh, uh, they share a lot of knowledge because that's reflected in shared names of plants. Um, and the Cowichan themselves have a history of traveling back and forth from Island uh, over to the Fraser River Delta, where they had relations with um, relationships with the other Coast Salish peoples there, and they had a, their own village, Tinas, on Lulu Island, where they would go, and some people year round, and other people went for fishing salmon and. Uh, and other fish from that area. So today we'll just talk about, uh, and this team has seen this, this program that I'm showing you. So I say we, um, I hope I do an okay job of representing this team. Um, but we talk about the cultural and ecological importance of uh, for the Cowichan and uh, other First Nations of these beautiful, native plants. i give a few examples of how people have related to these plants and looked after them, tended them, and, um, and then talk a little bit about how uh, we can maintain and sustain these beautiful species into the future for the benefit of the original people of this land and also the newcomers to get a better understanding of the importance of these beautiful plants and animals that they support. So actually approximately 130 different plant species are named in the Hulkamitnam language for, by, by Luzchim and other Cowichan speakers. And um, many of the ones that we describe in the book and that, that I describe here are not nearly as common as they used to be. And these plants have a whole host of different relationships with people used for food, for medicine, um, 
for materials for making things, for dyes and uh, for fire lighting as tinder and fuel, uh, and for spiritual purposes and ceremonial purposes as well. And you can tell how important they are by their role and stories and, as I said, in the language. So here we have one of my favorite plants also. You'll probably hear me say that this is my favorite plant and this is my favorite plant, but I guess they all are. Anyway, um, this is Tlaseep, Tlaseep. And that name Tlaseep is used here in uh, Hulkamitnam, but it's also uh, related to the Dittadat name in the Nuchanal uh, group of languages. And uh, it's, it's used in many different Salish languages as well the licorice fern. It has uh, rhizomes that uh, stretch around, un grow under the moss and branch out. And if you take a tiny piece of that, the end of the rhizome of uh, seep and chew on it, it has a very, very sweet taste. Um, they found a compound, polypodicide A, it's called that 600 times sweeter than sugar by taste. And so this plant was used as a mouth sweetener and mouth freshener, as well as as a sweetener for medicine that was made from tree bark, maybe and was a little bit bitter tasting. This sweetens it up. Um, it's always nice to walk around with a tiny piece of it just in, in your mouth that gives you a really sweet flavor. So these are some of the key habitats within uh, the the overall um, area of the Cowichan Nation, um, mostly within an, around Duncan and that area, uh, from sea level up to the moderate elevation in the mountains, we're in the rain shadow of the Vancouver Island Mountains and the Olympics, and so we have a drier area on the east southeast part of Vancouver Island that is within the coastal Douglas fir biogeoclimatic zone, um, which is really confined to just to the east coast of Vancouver Island and the opposite islands, the Gulf Islands, and a little bit on the mainland. And within that zone is a very much drier zone, which uh, is where the Gary Oak grows, as well as Arbutus and a lot of prairies and grasslands. So we find the camas grows really well in these very dry prairies. We have starting at the ocean floor, the subtidal and the intertidal zones, which of course are, provide a lot of uh, a lot of the food and uh, materials and medicines that people use. We have the beaches and estuaries of rivers and all of the different wetlands with their typical species that grow in wet places. We can think of skunk cabbage and willows and um, well, pond lily, lots of, lots of different plants that, are, that need that moisture to grow. And then we have the big old growth forests with Douglas fir and grand fir and a little bit of hemlock and a bit of Western red cedar and spruce and the uh, Sitka spruce and the wetter places. And then we, if we go up to the higher elevations where Liz Chim took me up towards Mount Aerosmith, um, where he used to hunt as a young man, we have the upper elevation species, the yellow cedar and a uh, lodgepole pine, which also grows in peat bogs, um, mountain hemlock. And um, yeah, those are mostly the trees that you find at that, at that elevation. And subalpine fir, which is the upper elevation kind of uh, relative of the grand fir that grows with Douglas fir at lower elevations. And then we have above the tree line, the subalpine parkland and alpine mountain tops, which also have their own complement of species. And all of these areas were accessed and used by the Cochin and uh, neighboring groups uh, to provide all of the different resources that they need. So essentially this entire region, the entire continent, we need to think about more as a biocultural system. Sometimes we separate out 
uh, the ecosystem, we talk about wilderness, we talk about the environment, and then we talk about people as this kind of separate entity and what is natural and what is cultural. But in fact, you can't separate out these, these concepts because people have lived on this continent for at least 15,000, well, since time immemorial, since anyone can ever remember, people have been here and have been worked with and used and interacted with and supported and sustained the other species uh, that, that we rely on with gratitude and with care. So if we think about these biocultural systems, uh, that's much more realistic, I think. And when we're talking about invasive species, we think of the impact not just to the ecosystem, but also to the cultural system of people, to the biocultural system. So I've talked a little bit about looking after the plants, and there were various ways that people had different approaches to caring for the plant resources, and not just keeping them living, as in Doug Dewar's in my book, which is uh, related to a Kwakwala word that means keeping it living, but also not only sustaining, but also promoting and enhancing the productivity and the growth of these plants, especially the ones that people rely on. So the careful and selective harvesting of plant products. It's easy to harvest berries selectively, but think about the other animals that rely on these foods as well and always leave some for the bears and the, the birds don't just take everything. Um, and also when you're harvesting bark, like the cherry bark um, for uh, decorating baskets or wrapping implements, you are very careful just to remove the outer layer. You don't cut down into the growing cambium. And so you can remove parts of plants. These are all perennial species, trees, shrubs, perennial herbs. So you can remove parts of them, little bits of the licorice fern rhizome without destroying the entire plant. And that's what people did a lot. Also, they maintained a different mosaic of different successional stages by using clearing and burning over areas to keep the brush down and to maintain the prairies and um, to, to provide the best habitat for berry bushes and so forth. Even the digging of root vegetables like the camas, um, they didn't just take them all. They were very careful and uh, they practiced a little bit of judicious weeding around the root vegetables. The digging actually helped churn up the soil and aerate the soil, just like with the clams and the clam gardens, and always replanted the little ones or the segments of roots or the tiny camas bulbs, replanting them so that they will grow and flourish and can be harvested a few years hence. They also pruned the berry bushes and um, and some of the trees like crab apples and, and willow um, to, and that promoted their growth just as pruning an orchard apple will promote its growth. And we always um, often talk about, you know, this whole area belongs to everybody, but in fact, there were very strict rules of ownership or proprietorship. It wasn't like uh, the Western notion of property ownership, though. It, it was very much like this individual, this family, this community has the responsibility to care for this area, for these resources. So ownership comes with it, with a lot of responsibility. And then um, just the fact of people from a community spreading out across the land uh, dispersal during the seasons, going to different places and harvesting at different er areas uh, can help to reduce the impact of people in any one particular spot. And then the entire ceremonial management where people would, uh, there were taboos against harvesting in certain areas and in certain places. So they had very special places where only certain people were allowed to go. 
and this would help to also to maintain uh, the plants and animals that live in those places. So for the Gary Savannah, for example, a really good example of how for thousands of years, people have looked after um, this, this particular habitat um, and use fire judiciously and carefully. And I have to say, um, I might say it later as well, but Luzchim uh, learned about using fire from Luz from his grandparents and from his parents. Um, and in fact, burning was suppressed by the European newcomers. Um, starting mostly back around the time when Smokey the Bear was born and people were stopped from using fire and, and they weren't allowed to burn. And all of the elders that I've worked with who knew about use of fire uh, say that since they weren't allowed to burn, um, the, the areas have become bushy and the berries are fewer and the root vegetables are fewer than, and some of them have disappeared altogether because they're not allowed to burn anymore. And so just recently with the horrific fires that we've had in the Chilcotin and uh, well, you know about the Lytton fire, a really good example of what happens if you let the uh, undergrowth take over without clearing areas in between. You have these horrific fires that take over and just burn everything out. Um, and that didn't happen so much. And people were carefully using fire to clear over areas to reduce the bush and to maintain the prairie grasslands. And these grass fires that people had, um, they, were, they were very quick. And some of the early accounts from the settlers who witnessed these fires back in the 1850s, 1860s was um, that you could you could just jump over them. If you came to a fire that was burning across a, a meadow, you could just hop over it and keep going. It was that low and that uh, because, you know, when there's not that much fuel load, it just burns over quickly and it gives a quick shot of a fertilizer in the form of ash um, to the plants that are growing, like the camas. So in many places, what the Europeans witnessed when they arrived into this part of the world, and they saw this beautiful, magnificent oak uh, woodlands interspersed with beautiful prairies and uh, wildflowers, and they thought it was, quote, the perfect Eden, which is what some of them called it, James Douglas for one. Um, but what they were witnessing was the traditional management of these areas. And the same up in the interior with the Sule and Nflakatmuch uh, and Schwetmuch and Lilwat Sletlimuch. So here it's, uh, here's what Luz Chim had to say. We might as well read the whole thing since he's not here to talk about it himself. But this is, I did my best in, in, in doing the book to include a lot of the direct quotes from our, my interviews with Luz Chim so you could see his own words uh, in his own experiences. In the Cowichan Valley, there's some at Kwamichan. Kwamichan the Ka he's talking about Camas, which we'll talk about in a minute. And Kwamichan stretched to the stone church all the way to what is now the Samanos Lake. And there and other places, we burned the ground area every few years. It comes from many different elders, including great grandfather Lischim. So all along with Spano in those kinds of places, there's also other berries, such as Quilmo trailing blackberries and your black caps and the strawberries. So what Luz Chim, his great grandpa, shared with me, after a few years, the ground will turn sour. So that's what he called it. Ni satyum tu So you burn the ground, burn the grass and other vegetation to sweeten the ground. That's his words, sweeten the ground so that the ashes will fertilize the ground. He said that the strawberries would get really tiny, but after you burn, the berries will be the size of your thumbnail. And that's what we've been witnessing without the fire. 
the strawberries and the other berries are tiny and some of them have disappeared from places where they used to grow in abundance. So we just uh, share with you a few culturally important plants and um, we'll move through them rather quickly, but we'll be able to share this PowerPoint with you so you can uh, go through um, more fully at a later date. So this is calm and I'll do my best to do the Halkamitnam pronunciations, but usually I would ask Lucien to do them to make sure I don't make a mistake. But Lucien talked about how they use the uh, this bull kelp, um, among other things, to uh, not, not only as an anchor to tie your canoe boat when you're fishing, uh, but you also use it to cure your uid bow by placing the bow inside and heating it uh, under a fire. And that helps to keep your uid bow flexible and limber. And here we have the sechelum, sorry, uh, the, the sword fern, which is an important uh, sacred plant, a ceremonial plant for the Cowichan. Uh, some people like the Saanich people use these in their cooking pits when they're cooking camas and the dididat, they spread the fronds over the salal branches and they put their food on top and intersperse it. Um, but the Kowich, for the Kowichan, they use these fronds in their winter dances, and it's really considered to be a sacred plant. And then we have um, uh, which comes from the word for strong smell, the Pacific Coast juniper, which is, an, again, a very uncommon tree in Canada. It's just found in this little narrow coastal zone with uh, with uh, Gulf Islands and so forth. And it's again used uh, in the sweat lodge to cleanse the house and uh, to for purification purposes. And, and this is one that Lucien talked about a lot, the white pine. And when we're talking about invasive species, it's not just the weedy plants that we need to talk about because what happened here, the Eastern white pine blister rust invaded the west coast and the uh, impacted our western white pine and killed so much of so many white pine trees. This chief said when he was young, their, their forests had lots and lots of big old growth white pine. And, uh, and then he could see that they were dying out in the 1960s, they started turn, turning red and they were impacted by this blister rust and he remembered some trees that were so big when they were lying down as logs you couldn't climb over them. So this is one tree that's really been impacted by an invasive species. And then we have the Pacific yew which is a very strong uh, wooded tree that's used for bows, uh, for digging sticks and for wedges and um, yeah, it's very strong wood and it's also known as a good medicine. So this is another tree that you can harvest partially and leave the tree growing. And sometimes it improves with a bit of pruning, but yew trees are not very common anymore. Then we have the rattlesnake plantain, a spiritual plant um, in the orchid family. Um, people use it uh, in various ways for medicine. You can rub the leaves until they come apart and you can use it as the inside part as a poultice. But again, uh, for the Cowichan people, it's a spiritual plant and we don't ask about those things. Those are, that's private knowledge. Western red cedar, uh, one of the most important trees and uh, found the big trees are used for the dugout canoes, of course, for the houses, for the house posts, for splitting planks and making boxes. And again, a very spiritual plant. The branches are used in ceremony and for ceremonial bathing, as well as for medicine. And again, when people harvest the bark for baskets or for uh, mats, 
they don't tar or for clothing, they don't take the whole, all of the bark. They take one strip, like you can see in this picture, all the way up. And they leave the tree with one strip and it will eventually heal itself and, and gradually grow over until in a hundred years or so, that tree will still be alive and you wouldn't know that somebody had taken some bark from it. The same with the roots, with the branches, you just take a few. The same with the yellow cedar, very fine bark. You have to go to higher elevations. And Liz Chin said, you know, the man of the house isn't lazy if there's yellow cedar bark in your household. So it means that he traveled far up and got some cedar bark there for, um, for his family. The wood is great for making paddles. Douglas fir, say, uh, really important tree. And you can see the big old growth Douglas firs on our part of the island here have uh, charcoal scars. So these, uh, uh, these withstood fire, uh, some of the, the original burning and maintained there, um, still, still kept alive because it has very thick bark. And the young trees are used for poles, for dip net handles, um, uh, for, um, yeah, for spear handles and so forth, and the pitch for medicine. And uh, this is a picture that I took of Cap uh with a dip net um, up around Lytton area, uh, where the two rivers come together. Native Douglas fir. The red alder, Kulala Osp, um, a very important tree, important med medicine from the bark, red dye from the bark. You can eat the inner bark. Um, the wood is good for fuel, for smoking fish and for carving. But sadly, this is a, a species that um, somehow industrial foresters have taken to think that it's like a weed. It's not, it's, it's a native species and it has an important role as a pioneer species in our early successional forests. But people have used weed killer on it or girdled it. And um, to me, this is really wrong to this team as well. We have the cascara, a tree that is a, an important medicine tree, but also uh, Simon Charlie, his uh, this team's dad, used to carve the wood for tool handles, for adzes and axes and so forth. The big leaf maple, come an osp, which means a paddle tree. And it has another tree, another name as well. And these big old maples are not nearly as common as they used to be. Uh, they're really impacted along with the cedars by the dry, hot summers. We have the true firs, uh, how the grand fir, the mabilis fir, and subalpine fir. And they all have these blisters on the young trees, pitch blisters. If you break those open, the very strong smelling mixture of um, uh, volatile oils and resin that is in, an important medicine and wash. Uh, and the black cottonwood, another beautiful big tree that is used uh, for medicine um, to make a hair shampoo uh, and for cosmetic self. And kwaop. The crab apple, uh, Liz Chim remembered when he was young, whenever he needed to go hunting for grouse, he would always look in a crab apple tree because the grouse love those apples, one of their favorite places to roost. So when people harvested uh, bark for medicinal use, like the cascara or the alder, um, they would, again, just take part of the tree, just take a square of the bark and leave it and it will eventually heal over just like this alder tree here it's gradually growing back as you keep the tree alive keeping it living uh, the arbutus or madrone is another um, important culturally important plant um, which is used 
uh, for medicine, that was something that was learned by observing the deer and how they used the leaves and the bark for medicine. And they didn't eat the berries, but as Lishin said, the berries are edible. And do, birds like pass by, like the band-tailed pigeons love to eat the berries. Uh, all of these raspberry, blackberry relatives all have their own importance and their use in various ways, dried for winter use and eaten fresh. And uh, all of them were improved by the use of fire and clearing and pruning. Leela, the uh, salmon, salmon berry, tukwam, tukwamu, blackberries, black caps, sorry, black raspberries. Tush nuts, the Sask Saskatoon berry. I know how important it is for you folks up in the interior in the Tlacatmuk and Slatlimuk languages, their names for five, six, or seven different varieties. Luschim knew the name for four different kinds here on the island. So they used the wood for dip nets and for arrows and, uh, and ate the berries, of course, dried them for winter. Uh, Pulp, the devil's club, very important medicine. Again, harvested with great care. This team would just take a branch or two, and when he would gather it for medicine, he would cut the top part off and stick it back in the mud, and it would continue to grow. And uh, I won't even try to pronounce the name of the red osier dogwood, um, but a uh, red willow is sometimes called, uh, but this is named after its the red color of its branches. And people didn't eat the berries here, but they certainly used the uh, the leaves and bark for as a medicine for uh, poultice for stings and cuts and bruises, and it's also used for sacred purposes. Up in the interior, some people, like my dear friend, Dr. Mary Thomas, used to eat the berries. She didn't like them too much, but her grandma made a mix of these berries together with Saskatoon berries, called it sweet and sour. And she used to feed that to Mary. Also used for medicine up there. And uh, the hazelnut, another really important food plant for the Cowichan and all up into the interior and up into the Skeena as well. And of course, everyone knows the squirrels love these nuts. And um, the branches are used for making dip net hoops, hoops and other purposes as well. Taka, Taka. Uh, Luchim told me the name is the same as word for liver because of the color that, that the berries have of the salel. And again, a high energy food for uh, winter time. They would dry, dry these berries and cakes and use the branches in pit cooking. And the two kinds of Oregon grape, named after the yellow color, um, um, but not, not only was, was the bark used for medicine, uh, but it's also used to make a yellow dye for basketry. And the berries are a little sour, but they're still used as a thirst quencher if you're out hiking and you need to get thirsty. You can put a few in your mouth and they'll quench your thirst for a while. And of course, uh, the Hudson Bay tea, um, Liz Chim knows about this and they used to go over to an island very close to where I live here um, off, uh, off Ladysmith to pick the Labrador tea in, in peat bogs. And some of the berries related to blueberries, huckleberries, blueberries, cranberries, all of these had names, all delicious fruit that people looked after, harvested, made into cakes for winter and so forth. We have two species of elderberry and uh, the berries are edible, but you should cook them, especially the red ones before you eat them uh, because they contain some uh, 
compounds that produce cyanide when you crunch up the seeds or the bark or whatever. So they're used with great care for medicine and you can eat this, the cooked berries as a sauce or dried for winter, but don't eat them raw. Maybe the blue ones you can a little bit, but not too many. And then we have all the currant and gooseberry relatives. Uh, this is called the stink currant or skunk currant because it has a little bit of a mousy smell, but it's not an unpleasant smell at all. And, uh, and again, used as a thirst quencher, Liz Jean would tell you when, when you're out hiking in the mountains. And the gooseberries, there's these beautiful black gooseberries uh, that again, aren't nearly as common after they've, they've stopped people from burning. Uh, because these bushes do really well after fire. And again, Luzjim was taught uh, that, that the stems are good medicine. And of course, we have squaisum, uh, the frothing, foaming soap barrier, sopalali is the Chinook name, a delicious uh, whipped confection that you can make from these berries. And everybody around here and up in the interior, you all know it. Uh, from your home places, especially in the interior. They're not common on the island. And often the Cowichan would get these berries through trade with their uh, friends and relatives up in the interior. By the way, Luz Chin told me that his dad and uh, great, his grandfather told them that the Cowichan people traveled. There was one time in particular that they traveled all the way up the Fraser River and the Thompson, all the way to Kamloops, and they met the Shwetmuk people there um, and, and uh, traded with them. So there was a lot of traveling going on, even in the early days. And of course, the important camas I've talked about is one of the, the plants that does well in these scary oak uh, meadows or prairies, spenu, dug up with a digging stick and carefully selectively harvested. Uh, there are two species and you have to be careful not to get it confused with the death camas. The bulb of this white or uh, cream colored flower species is poisonous. So people, that was part of people's knowledge to know how to look, how to select the right edible plants. Then we have wolf, the tule, round stem bulrush. This is a picture taken by Edward Curtis of a Cowichan woman at Lake Cowichan harvesting the tule. And this is a mat with about 4,000 tule stems uh, in, the, in the museum in Vancouver, at the, the museum at UBC. And they made, they sewed these together with the sticks made from the ocean spray. Amazing technology that people had. And as the skunk cabbage, these big leaves are not edible. They're related to arum, um, but they make wonderful plates. You can make uh, berry drying mats from them and you can even make a drinking cup from them. Sort of used like wax paper, but you don't eat it. And uh, Lucien told an amazing story. I wish he was here to tell it to you about the beaver people who were they found along the Cowichan River um, giving out gifts and the gifts were skunk cabbage leaves. And uh, here's one, the Wapato that Luchim's mother told him, they actually brought the tubers from the Fraser Valley uh, right to over to Vancouver Island and transplanted them into lakes around here on Salt Spring Island. And this, uh, they call it skauth, which is, means potato, it's the same as potato, but kokolots is another name that's used down in uh, the lower Fraser. And this is the same name that Mary Thomas gave it, kokolots up in the Shushwap at uh, Salmon Arm. The stinging nettle, the name means poison or stinging. And a lot of people thought this was an invasive introduced weed. 
when I was learning about botany, that's what I was told. But I don't believe it for a minute because it, it's named in every single language and there's stories about stinging nettle man and how it's used for uh, to make a uh, fishing line and fish nets that go way, way back. So this is a plant that grows right around the circumpolar region and is used uh, for its twine and for medicinal purposes everywhere where it grows. And another one that I think is uh, has uh, native populations as well as introduced is the one called frog's blanket um, that uh, Luz James and other elders know about as a poultice medicine. You pull out the the fiber of the broadleaf plantain and use it as a poultice. And a very, very important plant, kachmin. Uh, this is a plant in the celery family. And these seeds are important for sore throats and colds, for treating them, but also it's an important spiritual plant. It's used as an incense and in the first salmon ceremony. You can also eat the young greens of this plant and um, many people did that as well. And the yarrow, again, a lot of people think of yarrow as being weedy, but in fact, it's named in every language, often called little chipmunk's tail or squirrel's tail, and if you translate the name. And it's one of the most important widespread medicinal plants, I'd say, in the world, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. It's found in Asia and Europe, and it's used everywhere to stop bleeding um, as for toothache and for many, many other purposes, for colds and coughs and sore throats. Um, and again, stopping bleeding is very important. I wish I had more time to tell you stories about how people use these plants. Um, and this is one, uh, I put it in because uh, it's related to a plant that is considered an invasive weed and that's the wild carrot. But this is the native Pacific hemlock parsley. It looks a lot like the garden carrot and it's also named as the same name as the garden carrot. So, um, but this is a plant that was a root vegetable long before the garden carrot was introduced. And we have the wild form of the garden carrot that's all over the place now. And you have to be careful if you use these plants, you have to know which ones are poisonous. So there is uh, a native, very poisonous relative, the water hemlock. And there's also the weedy introduced poison hemlock the one that killed Socrates, uh, and that's growing wild all over the Victoria, Southern Vancouver Island area. So you have to really know your plants, know which ones uh, are native and which ones are introduced, but also which ones are good to eat and used for medicine, which ones aren't. And of course, I had to put in the wild strawberry, one of my very favorites, and one that's not nearly as plentiful uh, the past decades. And um, people say it's because they're not allowed to burn and because the areas where the wild strawberry used to grow around Victoria, for example, are taken over by weedy grasses and other in invasive plants. Another one that's not as common as formerly is the bitter cherry used for its bark. The fruit is another thirst, thirst quencher. The cherries are a bit bitter, but you can <laughs> suck on them if you're thirsty. And so there are all these concerns and what we've done. We, I say, mainly the European newcomers have done to this land is pretty atrocious. And you can see the, the signs of what we've done everywhere, the, the big clear-cut logging and the impacts that that has had. But when we do this, this damage to the land and we bring in the weedy plants that take over from the native ones, you know, all of this is a huge impact um, that we have to recognize and take as many steps as we can, working together, all of us, to, uh, to restore and reclaim these areas and to bring them back to the, their original 
richness and luxuriousness. And now we have the effects of climate change. And the best thing that we can do is to bring back the diversity of original species and habitats that, that have been here since time immemorial. So we have these problems. Lishim is totally aware of them, um, has talked about them a lot. What we've done in filling and draining wetlands and mining and the clear cut logging and so forth. We have a lot of work to do to bring these areas back. Um, but working together and carefully and systematically, um, we can make a huge difference. So as I said, it's not just plants, but it's just talking with my neighbors on the island here, Protection Island, that there's a bullfrog in one of the ponds now. Bullfrogs are invasive and we never had them up until just this, this year. Um, we have invasive lizards, invasive bees, invasive birds, um, and fungi, as I mentioned. So, uh, and not to mention some of the invasive sea life that we have. We have to think about all of these and we're never gonna get rid of them, but we have to make sure that we keep places where the native original species have places to grow and flourish and that they're not just totally wiped out. So as I often say, we've homogenized the world by bringing our backyards with us from Scotland or England or Europe, Ger Germany, whatever, um, and introducing them around the world. We have the knapweed, we have the invasive grasses and a lot of other, uh, the European or Japanese knotweed and so forth. Um, so we have to try and just do the best that we can to uh, realize the importance of the richness of our own, uh, the native species that live here and look after them. So that's why your work is so important to recognize these species and to protect and restore these precious plants and animals, to, to learn their names and the knowledge of the people who've lived here for thousands of years and ensure that we recognize this knowledge, we appreciate it, we hold our hands up to the knowledge holders and the people who are working, all of you who are working to protect and tend these species over the countless generations. So I'm sending you a heartfelt thanks using this beautiful heart-shaped leaf wild ginger and uh, this beautiful little cactus that is quite rare now on the Gulf Islands and Vancouver Island. Um, but it's one of the ones that Lushim talks about often. Haichka, thank you and keep up all your good work. There, I stopped sharing my screen. <laughs> well, Nancy, thank you so much. We hold our hands up to you and all the fabulous knowledge and experience and wisdom that you and Luchim um, have shared with us. Thank you so much. It's such a gift to have this, um, this presentation and uh, we so appreciate it. I'd like to um, spend five or six minutes and, and have questions. I know there's a couple of questions coming into the chat box. Um, Nancy, are you able to stay for a little bit to, uh, yes, to address yeah. some of them? That mm -hmm. would be great. Um, so folks, just a reminder, pop your questions into the chat and we'll read through them. Um, the first one is from Stephanie. She's wondering if um, Wapato is still found on Salt Spring Island or the surroundings after being transported from the interior. And she had an interesting comment. Uh, I find it so interesting that people moved plants around historically considering our notions and perhaps challenging our notions of what a native plant is. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. That's a great question. And um, it's funny because we just had a paper published in American Anthropologist, my friend Dana Leposky and, um, and um, uh, Chelsea Armstrong and myself that's called borrowing, what's it called? Adopting a root. 
is what it's called. And it comes from one of the elders from Hartley Bay talking about a special yellow fruited red elderberry bush that was growing up in Prince Rupert. And this elder said, when she heard about it, somebody should go up there and adopt a root and bring it back to Hartley Bay. And, and uh, you know, over the years that I've worked with elders, I have so many stories of people uh, transplanting stinging nettle or the uh, shui um, or mountain potato. My friend Mary Thomas up in, uh, in the Shwetmuk country around Salmon Arm and Enderby, she always was growing uh, rice root and other plants in her garden, bitter root she transplanted here and there. My friend Annie York from Spuzzum, she had uh, white fawn lilies from uh, and other plants from down in the Fraser Valley growing in her garden. And there was a Pacific crabapple tree growing right by her house that had been brought from down in the Fraser Valley area. And there's uh, stories about transplanting rice root from the coast up into the interior. And there's forest gardens where people brought in all these different plants like wild ginger and other plants into specific areas, crabapple, highbush cranberry, Saskatoon berry, um, you know, all of those things, they, they brought them and planted them all over the place. So I'm happy to share that, uh, that paper with you and, and the folks here, because um, it, it talks about that in more detail. I, to answer the first question, I'm not sure whether, um, Kokolots is still growing in lakes on Salt Spring, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Um, and but it was extirpated from salmon, the Salmon River estuary, where Mary remembered going down and harvesting it with her grandmothers. And so one of our master students at the time, Anne Garibaldi, worked with Mary. She brought hokolots from uh, a nursery and they planted it back down in the Salmon River estuary. And I have this amazing picture of Anne and Mary's daughter, Bonnie, raising their hands. This would be about 20 years after they transplanted it. And it's there it is still growing now in the Salmon River estuary. And I know it grows in a few places on Vancouver Island as well. So, um, it, things can be brought back with care and attention and, and people are doing this all over the place. So interesting. It, that's, it's great to hear about too, that, that, uh, that those plants move around and get reestablished and are, are used. And Ruby has an interesting comment. She, she just says, pondering culturally sensitive and important areas that include traditionally traded and cultivated plants. Yes, great, yes. great point. Yeah, absolutely. There's these, uh, well, we've started sort of coining a few terms, and one that we've talked about is cultural keystone places. We have cultural keystone species, which are ones that have really uh, important roles to play in particular areas. And um, there are many, many, of course, but there are also these special places that are often at crossroads where. Uh, where people have brought plants together and they're all growing in one place and being looked after and tended um, over generations. And uh, yeah, some of these places uh, are threatened by development and we see this happening. You know, if people don't understand where these special places are, they can build a highway right through the middle of them. And they've done that, or a mine, or a clear cut logging, or whatever. So it's really, really important to identify these places. We don't have to give too much information, um, but just so that people understand that these are really critically important areas. And many of them are wetlands and many of them are uh, at the edges of forests or, or at, along the coastline or whatever. And they need to be really specially looked after. So true. Thank you for that. I had a question here from an uh, uh, Indigenous friend of mine who couldn't come and she wanted to know if you have had an experience or seen knowledge transfer to youth in um, the communities that you've worked with, 
you know, this kind of knowledge being passed up, passed along. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and there's some really amazing young Indigenous people who are part of that knowledge transmission. So um, just as an example, my friend Adosti, Dr. Judy Thompson from the Taltan Nation, um, I've known her for many, many years, and she, uh, her master's project was with us working uh, through the University of Victoria, but we were working with the Gitkat Nation at Hartley Bay. And she uh, helped to organize and oversee a project called the Gitkat Plant Project. And we worked with the school and the principal uh, there in Hartley Bay. And Judy worked with them and worked out where the students in the school who didn't know that much about plants, they knew a lot about other things, but we used a paper bag with names of plants and the students could draw out a name. This was their plant. And they took on a research project as part of their schoolwork to go and talk to their elders about this plant and to, to do book research or web research as well, and to do a little write up about it. At the same time, I was working with the elders. And so we put together a booklet for the community, the Git -Gat, uh, plants of the Gitkat people. And the student reports were in there along with the other information about these plants. And that was, uh, Judy did that work for her masters and she wrote her master's uh, thesis about the Gitkat plant project and the process that they, to, to, to have that happen. And the, the, so those young people are all grown up now. They have kids of their own, but they're passing on that knowledge. And that's happening in many different places in different ways, but facilitated by these amazing young people like Stiawa, uh Lee Joseph from the Squamish Nation who is working on her PhD now, but she's also working in her own community and with the Taltan and other communities around the province, uh, again, facilitating the transmission of this knowledge um, in her own community and others. And the, I know there are people in Kapmo communities and Silik and Shwatmo communities who are doing the same kind of thing. It goes hand in hand with language revitalization or language promotion, whatever you want to call it. That's wonderful news. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Nancy, there's lots of wonderful gratitude and, and thank you all, all through the chat. Uh, Tanya Ball is saying, thank you so much for sharing. I just received your book as a gift. So amazing to actually hear you speak to it. This is what I want to start with in our nation and put together through our guardian program. Thank you, Tanya, for, for mentioning that. Uh -huh. And Tamara is saying, Thank you for sharing your knowledge, Dr. Turner. We are very fond of gathering stinging nettles in my family. Oh. So wonderful for soups and pesto. Let's I would see. love to try stinging nettle pesto, actually. Oh. I wonder if you have a favorite wild plant you forage for and what you use it for. Oh, thanks, Tamara. I um, I pick a lot. My Talta name is Berry Woman, Chicha Egadan, that Judy's grandparents gave to me. I, I have... I don't know if you can see it, a berry ring. Anyway, I love picking berries <laughs> and I love making everything with berries, pies and uh, muffins and um, jam and so forth. But I also love stinging nettles and I just put some in my freezer that a friend had brought and I make quiche, um, lasagna with stinging nettles and um, tea, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I, and I love using wild mushrooms as well. So I really love these, uh, these wild harvested foods. Yeah. That's so wonderful. I'm getting some uh, text about stinging nettle pesto recipes coming from me. I'm, I'm getting oh. really hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'd like that one. Yeah, me too. Okay, Lauren, you have to share that one with us. Um, Lorna is saying, thank you, Nancy, for your information. Shalus Garden has been growing the Indian corn seed that you gave me a few years ago. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That's wonderful, Lorna. Oh, I think of uh, my dear friend, Mabel Joe. 
uh, thinking about Shulush. And uh, she was just a wonderful woman who, who I spent a lot of time with when, um, when I was expecting our youngest daughter, who is now just visiting us. But uh, Mabel was the one who told me, uh, when your baby's born, she gave me a jar of mushrooms. And uh, she said, when your baby's born, you, you can open this jar. You, you can eat the mushrooms, but you wash your baby in the mushroom juice and it makes them really strong and independent because mushrooms are soft but they they can split logs apart they can move rocks when they grow and so i did that and so it worked <laughs> so our daughter's just visiting us now and she would i hope she doesn't mind i tell that story but uh, now she has a little girl of her own so <laughs> That was a long time ago, but I still think of Mabel all the time and I can see her smiling face. Oh, that's lovely. And isn't it fascinating how uh, now we know more and more about the power of, of mushrooms and fungi, about connecting all the trees in the forest. And, exactly. Um, yeah, no wonder it's such a powerful, powerful plant. Yeah. Well, any more questions, folks, please pop them into the chat. Um, if not, I'm going to pass it over to JJ just to, um, to thank you again, Nancy. We're gonna have a short break now for about four or five minutes. And um, I'd kindly ask that if you're not a member of the Indigenous Invasive Species Network or not an Indigenous guest or who's curious about our network to depart at noon, we're gonna, we're gonna reconvene um, at, at just after 12, just for a short time to discuss some of the business we have um, with the network figuring out ways that the network can guide us in our um, in in our work with invasive species and communities around you know supporting us in building capacity tasks that the, that the network would like us in the council to work on and how best we can support um, you so we'll be tackling those three questions in breakout groups after our uh, our short stretch break but I'll pass it over to JJ first and then we'll we'll have a break. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say thanks, Nancy. That was great. Uh, I think you represented uh, Luschim well enough that he wasn't able to make it. But um, no, it was great to, to hear your knowledge and your stories and just reflect on on uh, some of my values and the way I look at things. And it's good to know that I'm kind of in line with, with the path that you're going and I can respect that. Um, you know, the big one I, I look at is, is take what you need, right? That's that's a big one for my eyes and trying to get on industry and uh, contractors and the working world to understand that value and that aspect is a, is a tough one to get across sometimes. And yeah. Um, out of out of that, um, you know, that's one of my bigger takeaways is, is just to take what you need and, and respect uh, the land at, at all costs. So thanks again, Nancy. Thanks, JJ. And thanks, all of you. Um, if you have other questions, um, uh, Sue can or, or Stephanie or others can pass them along to me and I'll do my best to respond. And it's good to be, have been with all of you this morning. And again, Thanks I so raised again. my hands to Liz Team. I know he'd be disappointed not to be with you, but um, yeah, it's just these things happen with technology. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We will be in touch with him and, and with you, Nancy. Thanks so much okay. again. You're and so folks, welcome. Um, we will see you again in about five minutes. We'll reconvene at 12.03. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone.